So awesome. Yes, good. Excellent. All right, cool. I am Mrs. Johnson and I am here with Mr. Hansen in the background as well. He'll be moderating the um, first half of the chat and then we'll be kind of um, swapping with each other. So this is the first time we've used this tool for a webinar. So bear with us if we have any hiccups or just weird things that happen, but hopefully not. And um, we're excited that we're able to kind of offer this service to uh, our parents. So it will also be archived, but um, we wanted to make sure that everything's working on all ends. So Mr. Hansen, do I have the, the thumbs up? Cool. Okay. So as you, and I'm going to start on time because it's 1.30. So as you may notice, um, we did a session today called uh, Augmenting Your Digital Experience, and it was for freshmen. And uh, because all of our sophomores and juniors were taking the PSAT, so freshmen actually did four different rotations. One of them was with a panel of seniors. Another one um, was kind of talking about a little bit of um, kind of health and wellness. And then another one was a study hall. Then the other one, the fourth session or the fourth rotation was with myself, Ms. Johnson, and uh, Mr. Hansen. And it was on augmenting your digital experience. And uh, interestingly enough, nobody noticed that uh, 21 is not the atomic number for gold, but that's okay. It's actually um, a play because we wanted it to be the graduation year for our students. So, Again, this is uh, me, Mrs. Johnson on the left and Mr. Hansen on the right. And our email address, we have kind of a, a collective, you know, we each have individual email addresses, but we also have a collective email address, which is whsedtech at eansisd.net. And we offer that to, um, that way we can each answer it a little bit quicker. And we offer it to staff, we offer it to parents and um, our students as well. And again, just before I start, I wanted to one, welcome all of you that are listening live. Um, two, let you know that this will be archived. Three, uh, Mr. Hansen is on the back channel right now, so he can be answering questions and um, you know, kind of fielding anything like that while I go through all this information with you. So we always like to start with the why and and kind of tell kids you know this is this is really what our objectives are so our three objectives for this session that we delivered to students was one how to manage digital distraction um, another one was dealing with digital organization and then the third was kind of a growing awareness of social media and responsible use and so i'm going to kind of just start with digital distraction what was really cool is about um a week and a half ago we sent out an anonymous survey to all students. And what was cool about that is we got over 300 responses from freshmen um, all the way to you know, seniors, which was amazing. And there were a variety of responses and we asked them lots of different questions, which are gonna be basically sharing with you um, right now, their feedback. So the first topic was digital distraction. And the question that we asked was, what apps or online sites are most distracting to you? And we made it very clear, it's not, you know, it wasn't like an I got you or something like that, but we wanted to know what is distracting and then also collect responses on what might be really helpful or, you know, what are ways that students are kind of managing these sorts of things. So this is the data that we received. Um, it is actually proportional. So <laughs> because it wasn't out of 100%, these were all check boxes. So we said, you know, these are all the different things and then they responded. And so the top three you can see are social media, video streaming and um, text messaging, which aren't too surprising. And then you've got some other ones there as well. And then the next question we asked them are, what strategies, if any, do you find helpful when managing digital distractions? Because I think, I think it's safe to say that the vast majority of us, even adults, suffer with some sort of digital distraction. So it's not so much, you know, do they exist, but how are people managing them and, and healthy ways to manage them? So we did a little bit of, you know, family feud with the data. And the top three responses were um, do not disturb, which means they either put their phones in airplane mode or, you know, turn off notifications, something like that. 
And then um, a lot, another large group of students said they put it in another room. So they physically take the phone and put it somewhere else. And then um, the other I'm going to actually get into in just a moment. So what was interesting is the other kind of split into two different categories we found. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see proximity and communication. So some students are kind of advocating for themselves, which is awesome, and saying, you know, hey, boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, sister, whatever, I need to work on something for the next hour or so, you know, don't text me, don't interrupt me, you know, things like that. Another thing that people have found really helpful was putting their phone, you know, upside down. Um, also, maybe in a backpack versus your pocket, so it's not constantly on you. Or, you know, charging in a different room. I know both myself and Mr. Hansen talked about this too. Like, I physically have to. He said he puts his in his closet when he gets home. Um, I said I end up putting it in my bedroom just so I'm not distracted by it or giving it to somebody else. And then what was also interesting is we asked them, you know, what, what other things are working, you know, when you're studying or doing different things like that. And one of them was um, they said they used the Stay Focus app to block YouTube or Facebook. Um, another one talked about 10 minute video breaks. So we thought that was interesting. You know, it's like, hey, I, I work for 30, 45 minutes, whatever. And now um, I'm going to take a 10 minute video break. And the other one I thought was interesting. So I, I have an eight and a 10 year old child, um, not, not obvious, eight and 10 year old, two children, um, not the same age. And, you know, my eight year old, I can let him watch a show and he's like, Hey mom, I'm done. It's fine. The 10 year old, I say, watch one show. And then he's, you know, three shows. in. so I, I know that I have to treat them differently and kind of handle those situations differently. So one of the things that came up was time breaks for games. Cause a lot of times when kids are playing video games, you know, you'll just start and there's not, there's not an automatic, you know, stop and start time. A lot of times with video games, is you know, how many levels you're getting through, things like that. So there are a lot of video games and there are just, you know, within even games that allow you to, oh, hey, I'm just gonna play a round and the round is only, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, things like that. And then you can see, you know, checking phone in between homework, using social media as a reward for finishing it. So those were some other things. I also shared three apps with them. Um, you know, I think, and, and we, we kind of, Mr. Hansen and I both talked about this, but, you know, we, we graduated high school and college when we didn't really have these distractions. I mean, I had Napster in college and I had a pager in high school. And so it wasn't really until I became, you know, a little bit of AOL and instant, instant messenger, but, you know, it wasn't until I became an adult that I, I had to really deal with all of these digital distractions. And so I think we're all learning too. So the two apps on top are free apps. Moment um, runs in the background and basically tells you how long you're spending on your device, you know, what you're doing, that sort of thing. Flat Tomato works kind of like the, the Pomodoro method. So it's that idea of, you know, okay, I'm gonna do this task for 20 minutes and then it's gonna give me a five minute break and then ask me what's the next task I wanna do for 20 minutes and then I can kind of check them off. So it's just a nice way to do that. Forest is a paid app. It's $1.99. I downloaded it yesterday and, and I really liked it. I thought it was kind of a, a cool tool. So essentially how it works is um, you download it on your phone and you tell it, you know, you pick a tree and um, you tell it, hey, I want to focus for 30 to 45 minutes or however long you want, right? An hour. And then you set it and the tree grows that entire time. And if you make it to the end, then, you know, you get points and, and all that sort of thing. But if you don't, then the tree dies. I don't know how many people feel badly about killing a digital tree or not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, there's all this. And then, you know, the more times that you stay focused, you get like better trees, like a candy tree and all this sort of stuff. It sounds silly, but, you know, it's one of the number one apps in the app store. And I think, it, you know, it works for certain people. And again, we always reiterated, none of these things work for everybody there are things that are going to work for one person and not for the other but we really wanted to share some tools we also want to talk just about overarching sort of things especially since you know the district has a focus of social emotional learning skills um, if you aren't aware of what all of those are you can check out castle's um, site which is c-a-s-e-l and it goes through all of those um, kind of social emotional learning skills but Something else, you know, we've, we've had challenge success come in and, and especially if you've seen some of those speaker sessions. And so this was something I kind of brought up with kids. It's the question of what are values are, you know, most important to you? And just think about this, you know, is family time really important? Our community, you know, accomplishment, what are your three, you know, 
five most important values. And then ask yourself this question. How does your current social media, and really you could fill in the blank with current blank, um, contribute to or hinder you from those values? And we really wanted to stress, like social media is not inherently bad or good, um, just like technology isn't. It's, it's kind of like food. You know, you can have healthy food, you can have unhealthy food. It's, it's not so much the food, it's, it's how much of the food or, you know, the types of food and things like that. And so that's really what we wanted to stress with kids and get them, you know, thinking about. And the, the other piece that's important is when they're using tech or social media, why are they using it? So I, I fully admit that I'm a procrastinator. I have always been a procrastinator and it's just something I've, you know, kind of dealt with my entire life. And so I find sometimes when I'm doing things, it, you know, if I'm watching a lot of Netflix or I'm scrolling through Facebook or whatever, a lot of times I'm doing that as an avoidance behavior because I really need to be doing something else. And so just paying attention, you know, well, when I'm doing these things, am I just sharing something about my family or am I just bored and I don't have anything better to do? And just being cognizant of that is really, you know, half the battle on that. So that was kind of that section. And then we moved into digital organization, which um, I'm going to kind of go through. So the top question, and I'm, I'm really excited to share this with y'all because um, I, I find kind of the data from our students and, and kind of the, the way that things, um, they use certain tools is really interesting. And so one of the questions we asked were, what do you use to organize your assignments, upcoming exams, essays, projects, like you can see right there. And this is similar. Again, this was check boxes, so it's not out of 100%. Um, but what was interesting is 50% of our students, well, 50% of the students who obviously answered the survey, not 50% of our students, but 50% um, of the, those who answered the survey said they use a paper planner, which I thought was really interesting. And again, the survey was freshmen through um, seniors, so that was, was interesting information. And then um, about a fourth of them said they also use Google Calendar. And then that other organizational app is probably my homework. And then some use notes and some use reminders. So that was kind of good information for us um, to tailor kind of what we were sharing with them. Now, the next bit of information got into what tools are they using and, and what works. So on the left-hand side, you'll see digital tools. And these are some that you know, students have suggested that they're using Todoist, Trello, um, Google Keep, OneNote. And then some said they just leave tabs open on their computer or in Safari, and then they know those things have to be completed. I personally cannot deal with digital to-do lists. While I think they work for some people, they just personally don't work for me. And so we also talk, and, and a lot of other students, it's funny, when I asked um, just a show of hands, it was a good, um, I would say at least maybe 30%, 40% of them said they still do a lot of to-do lists um, by paper in some form or format. So on the analog tool side, you'll see, you know, memory, sticky notes, writing on their hand, um, which I thought was entertaining, especially since I've seen several things written on people's hands, like, you know, fish paper do or things like that. Um, folded paper in their pocket. And then if they do have a folder, you know, like one side of the folder would have, um, you know, homework that's due and then the other side of the folder, you know, would not or something like that. So the other things we kind of just shared with them were some tips for, since so many of them are using paper in some form or fashion, um, some tips. So one of them was writing down all upcoming assignments and then adding tests and long-term projects, adding in sports activities, family events, because a lot of times, you know, when you're working on that, you leave that stuff out and then you're like, oh, wow, I don't have time to do X or Y because of that. And then scheduling in blocks of time for homework and, and then um, number five, you can see numbering assignments in order of priority. So this was just something else we added in because so many students are using paper planners. Quite a few of them are doing some sort of form of bullet journaling or that. And so we wanted to share a few things. These are called mood trackers and habit trackers, especially since you know, they're wanting, we're a very poor historian of how we've, what we've done over a month and things like that. You know, yes, we do have some trackers that, you know, will tell you how many steps you walk and things like that. But if you wanted to know, you know, how often you read or something like that, that may not necessarily work for those particular tools. And so these are some things that people are doing. Um, high school students, college students, all over Instagram, as well as professionals are, are using some of these tools. 
And the mood tracker on the left-hand side uh, is, is pretty cool. I'm not that talented to draw that. I will show you a more simplistic version, but essentially each circle is a different day of the week um, or number essentially of the month. And then um, you have different colors corresponding to, you know, feeling or productivity or whatever. And then on the right-hand side is how many steps. And, you know, that's just kind of a step tracker. The next one I'll show you um, is a more simplistic one. You can see on the left-hand side. So you could have, you know, hey, I've got 30 days and I want to know how often I read or how often I worked on my essay or exercise or things like this. It's really great, you know, for visual sort of people. It's also just really great if you have kids who, um, you know, have special needs or something like that, where this just really helps them kind of over, you know, look at how much they've done and they feel a little bit better seeing it like that. There's another mood tracker on the right hand side, just because it was close to Halloween and, and um, Dia de los Muertos, I, I kind of threw that one in. The last one I share, I, I think this is fantastic. I, I talked with students and I, I said, I, I live by my to-do list, and if I don't have it, then I'm completely, you know, off kilter for the entire day. But, you know, there's a lot of times where you have things on your to-do list that you don't really want to do. Mine tend to be laundry and going to HEB. Um, thankfully, there is HEB curbside, which makes it so much easier, uh, but I digress. So this is an easy thing. You know, they can do like a productivity bingo. It's a fun way to gamify it. And, you know, they can just highlight um, ones that they've completed. If they want to get really fancy with it, then they can, you know, so I got all four corners. I get a Snickers bar or something. They can kind of um, do their own sort of enticements on that. And I left them with this information. This is what how I organize things. And, and what was really interesting is when I did the session on note-taking, uh, with students, which actually will be our upcoming session, what I we taught note taking and um, digital organization to all of our freshmen a few weeks back, I believe. And what was really interesting is about half of all of every time I asked, half of them use a paper planner in, in some form or fashion, and half of them t you know take notes by hand, or sometimes even more than half. So these were some things that I shared just. I told them I'm not going to share anything with you that I wouldn't use or do, or I, I think this is a good practice. So uh, looking at Google Calendar, you know, looking at my planner, and then I make a list of everything. I highlight things that need to be done as soon as possible. And then I will do a post-it note for that morning of things that I need to get done during the day, and then a post-it note um, in the evening. And that fudge, fudge factor is something kind of interesting. So a lot of times, and I know adults do this, but kids do this as well. You know, oh, it'll take me an hour to do my homework. It'll be fine. And then, you know, two and a half hours later, it really took them two and a half hours. So just knowing what that fudge factor is, and sometimes that means like anticipating how long something's going to take and then actually writing down how long something's going to take. So then they're aware of, oh, wow, every time I say, you know, it's going to take me an hour, it really takes me two. So my fudge factor, you know, is basically times two. So that's just, you know, you kind of get better into time management. Did you have some questions, Mr. Hansen, from anybody in the group before I switch over to you? Cool. I saw you jotting down things on post-it notes. Were you, were you making lists? <laughs> All right. So, so that's kind of the, the, information that I kind of front loaded with them. And now I'm going to let uh, Mr. Hansen take over. We're actually going to physically swap spaces. And um, he's going to talk to you about so the social media part of this and the cyberbullying. All right. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this first edition of WHS Tech Talks. Um, we are going to have our next session next Thursday at 1.30 and then the Thursday after that at 1.30 and it will be note taking on the iPad next Thursday, followed by Common Sense Media and um, digital, digital citizenship after that. So it'll be sharing some resources and sharing some things that we have shared with your students so you're aware of what's going on at Westlake High School and can help support that at home. So social media is, of course, uh, a part of our, all our lives these days, and it is definitely a part of your students' lives, as we found out through our survey and just from watching our students day to day. It is something that it is some that we've grown into, but it can be also some. It is definitely something that our students, your students, uh, have known their entire preteen and teenage life. 
So we talked about some of the positives and negatives and then just some of the facts about social media with your students today. And so I'll share some of those things with you right now. Uh, first and foremost, we asked your students, when do you check social media? So we thought this would be a good way to start the conversation about how do students uh, use their time? How do they check it? How do they check their devices? And it was interesting because in the session we had with, with the different groups, uh, a lot of them were actually checking social media. So it, would, it, it led into the conversation where we had them hold up their phones if they had them in their hands. And an overwhelming major, majority did have their devices in hand, uh, and adults included. Uh, so those statistics from the survey were 55% of our students that responded, that which was about 320 students out of the 2,800, uh, responded of 55 percent within five to ten minutes of waking up. 66 percent responded with five within five to ten minutes of going to sleep. And we did have a conversation about how that can interrupt your sleep cycles, uh, different things about the brightness of a device, as well as being engaged in a conversation online and then trying to relax and go to sleep. So shared with them some tips on hopefully putting down those devices before they go to sleep. 14% of the students uh, actually reported that they do not use social media. So that led into a conversation about what is social media. And it was an interesting conversation about what do we include and what do we leave out. And there was a lot of uh, disagreement about things like text messaging and email. So it can be argued that these things are, should be included in social media or should not be included. So it was, it was great to have that conversation with the students in there and discuss that. Some other statistics about that, 42% uh, reported checking their social media during class. Uh, I'm sure as parents you'll be interested to hear that. So yes, your students, half of your students mm -hmm. are uh, pulling out their phones because they can't access social media on their iPads because of our limitations on the iPads. They're pulling out their phones and keeping them usually under their desks and checking that social media during class. 59% um, reported uh, checking social media during social activities. And we talked about different groups of students and asked them to be aware and look at that in the next few days of groups of students that are sitting together at lunch and actually not even engaged with one, with one another, but actually engaged with their device. And um, not again, not as a bad or good thing, but just to be aware of how they're using social media and their devices. And then uh, the last one we touched on was during family time with 28%. I shared with them my experiences of uh, being engaged in family time and how in your teenage years, it's not always your favorite point, but later on in life, I think we all agree that's some of our fondest memories. And um, so they, I, really felt like there was some connection there and students, some students kind of perked up to that and encouraged them to put their devices away during that family time um, so that people, that, that families disconnect and are able to connect at the, at the dinner table or on weekends or whatever the case may be. The next item we asked them is uh, what kind of social media apps they use. And so this was, you know, my, the one I was most interested in as always, uh, I've been in some sort of education, experiential or public, for the last 20 years, and it's always been interesting to see trends with, with students. And so I hadn't looked at any data like this in the last couple of years from, from groups I've worked with, so I was interested to see, and I did see some different changes. Uh, some things I knew would be true were Snapchat was very popular. Um, I am myself not on Snapchat, uh, but it is very popular with our youth today. 73% uh, reported that, 74% on Instagram, so neck and neck with that. And then Facebook, as I did assume, has dropped to 33%. I believe that's more of um, our age group that is on Facebook. 27% uh, on Pinterest, and then only 21% on, on Twitter. The last time I looked at data like this, uh, I had over 50% of respondents saying they were on Twitter with a high school age group. And that was interesting to see that drop. And so we speculated about why that, that drop may be, maybe Twitter's too politicized these days or too divisive or maybe it's too focused on quote unquote adult news uh, of why you see that drop and, and why you see, do you see increases in more uh, photo sharing and video sharing such as Instagram and Snapchat. So we did discuss your online profile. So what are these companies? Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And so what are these companies actually doing and what do they get access to? So very few people, I'm sure uh, many of us included, actually read the privacy policies of companies when we sign up for social media 
uh, when we get the new iOS update, whatever it may be. Uh, some things that you will see in those privacy policies is microphone and camera access, and we discussed when a company has access to that microphone and camera. It, one privacy policy ago, Snapchat actually listed that they had unlimited access to your microphone and camera even when you were not using the app. Uh, their newest privacy policy has changed to what the, the norm is for the industry, which is microphone and camera access when you're using the app. However, that is not defined. Is it when you hit record? Is it when you simply have the app open in the background? And so we discussed that a little bit about situations you may not want a perfect stranger listening to your conversation or looking through your camera and to, to be aware of that and keep those apps closed when not in use. GPS and data location tracking were also a big one. Students started to pick up on this and, and we started to have the conversation about marketing revenue and how these social media companies actually make all their money. Uh, so tr tracking our location and tracking our GPS data. And again, that being on normally when the app is open, of course, Apple being one of the biggest collectors of that data. Likes and clicks, uh, social media companies can actually predict how we are gonna make decisions based on our history of likes, likes and clicks. Uh, we talked about how they build profiles of us online and sell those profiles to marketers. So we fit in certain categories or certain demographics and that is a big way advertisers love that information. And so this was a big awareness campaign uh, for our students to understand what exactly they're doing and how what they're doing is used. And the last thing we talked about is, you know, a new thing, especially with Snapchat, Facebook, is that face, facial rec recognition and what speculated a little bit about what that could look like in the future. Uh, this did prompt some of the students to, to ask about conspiracy theories that I quickly <laughs> moved away from. Uh, that wasn't the point of the conversation. It was more to make them aware of things that are going on, uh, not just uh, passively watching these things happen, but to be engaged and to understand what these companies are doing and, and how that, those things work. The uh, digital footprint is what we ended with and how students are a lot of times will put a lot, far too much personal information on social media, including things like their actual birth date, their full uh, given name, um, where they live, uh, who their friends are. And a lot of these things can actually be used by, by hackers to collect answers to the questions that we use to back up our password. So things like, where were you born? Who's your best friend? Uh, we put the answers to those things on our social media profiles that then hackers can look at. And it doesn't take them much to figure out what the answers to those questions are, and then they can actually get into our account and take over our account. Uh, so we, we discussed that a little bit, uh, again, about awareness, not to uh, frighten everybody and to stop using social media, but to be aware and to be safe and to use it responsibly. The next question we asked is, how do you think social media impacts your mood, which I, I think this is one you'll definitely be interested in hearing about. How are our students feeling about social media? Um, I'm happy to report that most students did say they were neutral. 48% uh, saying neutral, and then between neutral and makes me happy is 30%, with 14% reporting makes me happy. A very low number said it makes me sad or angry, and we did have that discussion. If social media or anything in life uh, makes you feel sad and angry consistently, perhaps you should find a new hobby or something else to do. So we talked about deleting profiles and moving on, or at least uh, temporarily pausing profiles until you were able to get a hold of whatever was going on in your life. Uh, and responsibly using social media and, and to use it as a positive thing and a way of interacting, not, not a way of, of driving um, negative feelings. Some positives of social media we pointed out were entertainment, networking, keeping up with friends and sharing news and events and social issues. And of course, some negatives were some of the things that we discussed with that, that range of emotions, envy of others, uh, potential for cynicism, a potential for depression and a biased version of reality. We discussed the whole rose tinted glasses effect where people do not post uh, the worst picture of themselves or the, the time that they barely passed a test. They will only post the most positive aspects about themselves. They will only post the perfect selfie with the perfect filter uh, <laughs> that, that they worked hard to achieve. Um, so it, it is a biased version of reality and while people can definitely celebrate in that online life, they shouldn't see it as the end all be all and they shouldn't compare themselves to other people and think that why are these bad things happening to me if no bad things are happening to anybody else. 
The uh, regrets and lies was a question we added in. We were curious to see with an anonymous survey if, if students had any re regrets about posts on social media or would admit to, that they have told a lie before. So we got some interesting data back. A um, uh, vast majority said no to the regrets on posts. So only a quarter of the students said yes, they had a regret about something they posted on. So that was actually, uh, you, you still don't want a quarter of students regretting, but that was pretty good to get back. I thought that number would be much higher. Um, however, the lies, you had about 40% say admitting to lying on social media. We didn't ask specifics about what those lies were. That could be an embellishment or, or something, but um, that is the reporting data we got back on, on that question. The next section we'll discuss is cyberbullying, which uh, as we, as I pointed out to students, has been a pretty hot topic in the last few years with some uh, very uh, tragic things that have happened to students because of cyberbullying. Bullying, of course, has been around since for a long time, which does not condone it, but cyberbullying has taken on a new aspect, and I think we as adults can admit that this happens in our lives as well, uh, where adults will get on and troll or uh, harass other adults and without that face-to-face -face understanding and without that empathy that for some reason a keyboard and a screen take us away from uh, it gets a little out of hand sometimes and people can be emotionally hurt by this the uh the first thing we talked about was of course the legal definition according to the texas education code cyberbullying is a person using any electronic communication device to engage in bullying or intimidation we then pointed out that this is actually a class A or class B misdemeanor. So majority of the time this is handled at an admin level in a school, uh, but if a student were to report it to the police, this could be prosecuted as a class A or class B misdemeanor. And uh, many of the students, I think emotions and expressions, they were surprised to hear this, that they didn't realize it was an actual law. So that may be something you'd like, you might wanna emphasize with your, with your child at home is talking about what is okay and what isn't okay according legally not just value-based, but legally according to uh, Texas state law. Uh, some of the statistics that uh, we pulled offline on stompoutbullying.org, a, a website you can visit, 19% um, of the students that they polled, ages 10 to 17, uh, reported being involved in online aggression. And 15% of those admitted to being aggressors with 7% reporting being victims. So you see some crossover in those statistics there. So it appears that some of the victims themselves self-reported as an aggressor. Um, speculation could say that because they were being cyberbullied, they, as a defensive mechanism, they turn it into the cyber bullier. Um, but it's not, we, we don't know the specifics on that. Also something interesting to point out was, and I've seen this in multiple studies, that girls are two times likely as boys to be victims of cyberbullying. Um, there's probably many sociological reasons why that is. Uh, if you wanna look further into that, I, I definitely see that pop up on quite a few studies of social media and the difference between genders. We talked about enabling. So you, you don't have to just be the aggressor or the victim, but there are two types of enabling, one being active and one being passive that students can actively enable uh, cyber bullies by, by liking things that they post, by encouraging cyber bullying, by laughing about it, by taking it lightly. And of course there is also passive enabling where the students are seeing the cyber bullying happening but not doing anything about it. And we talked about two different ways of doing that. You don't actually have to go uh, get in a conflict with the cyber bully, but maybe supporting the victim and reaching out to them and letting them know that whatever the cyber bully is saying is not necessarily the truth, that they that you support them. So we talked about different ways to do that that don't necessarily involve your child getting in a conflict with those cyber bullies. We also uh, addressed what do I do? So if a student is a victim of being a cyber, of being cyber bullied, uh, we encourage them to screen, screenshot the harassing messages. Um, the reason for that is not to go back and look at them over and over and brood over them, but of course to have a record of what's going on. Um, in, in my experience and working with a high school age group, I have seen that many students that are cyber bullies will go back and regret their decisions and delete those posts. So having uh, a record of that is, is a pretty 
pretty good idea, especially if it is something you're going to report. Um, resist emotional responses was a big one. So don't take that knee-jerk reaction and start lashing out back, but just to take a moment, put your phone down and put to, close the computer and, and then tell somebody you trust, which is the last one. And of course, the third one being block and unfollow the cyberbully. If somebody is acting that way to you, and you know they're not a friend, you know they're doing it out of spite or insecurity or whatever, to so just block them or unfollow them just to, to, to be done with that. We've all been through uh, high school. We all know that sometimes you get caught up in social situations just because of the way your, your subculture works at, at a high school level. So sometimes those things are hard to do. So we definitely encourage them to tell somebody they trusted. And I also encourage them to tell those people whether they wanted the person to take action or not, because sometimes students just need to share and that we were open as well as all Wesley High School staff, but definitely to, to talk to their parents about it and to let them know what's going on and not let them find out on the back end. Another thing we asked, uh, that we asked of our students was to tell us what types of online behavior they felt warrants blocking or reporting users. 47 of our respondents said cyberbullying or harassment, so that fit pretty consistently with what we're saying here. Uh, 28 said inappropriate or offensive content, which is pretty subjective, uh, but I think students, when answering that question, probably had a, a good idea, explicit material, things of that nature. Spamming, of course, uh, they thought 13 of them thought that would should get you blocked on social media, and lying, only six. So I guess uh, in, some, in some cases, uh, lying or embellishment is, is okay on social media, just like it is in life. I never caught a two-foot fish. Um, but when I told the story, I did. Uh, other things that people said were fake people, shaming, racism, using someone else's work and taking credit for it. So some copyright issues there. Uh, violates terms of service. So that would be for the specific company. Sharing offensive content, mainly because it reflects poorly on me, was a, was a quote we got from a student. And I wish reporting spam or hurtful people was easy everywhere. So. Looking at that and thinking of ways that you can talk to your child about uh, their life, uh, their digital life, is maybe they're not fully aware of what actions they can take. So having those conversations about maybe not specific, well, when you're on Twitter, you can do this. When you're on Facebook, you can do this. But really reaching out to them and, and understanding that these things do happen. I mean, according to that national study, almost a, a fifth of the respondents reported being uh, involved in some sort of cyberbullying. So one out of five chances your child has been involved in this or might be involved in this in the future. So having some strategy to deal with that and in order to, as a victim or if they see a friend cyberbullying or something like that, in order to deal with those things or if they see some things online that they'd like to report, how to do those things and empower them to do those things so that we can make it a, a, a better a better environment online for us all. So again, uh, we want to thank you guys for joining our first uh, Tech Talk, Westlake High School Tech Talk. Uh, you heard from Lisa Johnson, who's coming in camera. Whoop, whoop. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and um, who discussed some of, of the digital distractions and organization with you. And of course, I'm Chris Hansen. Uh, discussing social media with you. If you guys have any questions, please email us at the WHS EdTech at EansISD.net. We're more than happy to, to answer questions at any time, whether it is about a device or insurance, but of course we, we love to field conversations about how your students are using devices and uh, things that are going on at the high school. And if there's other, and if there's other topics that, you know, aren't on our list because it's just kind of something we're trying out and, and kind of working through the software and all of that. But if there are other topics that you're interested in seeing, um, we're happy to kind of add those to this kind of new form of communication that we're using. So, Yeah, and we'd love, we'd love any feedback that you have, uh, this being our first webinar. Uh, and I know some other departments were interested in how this would work. So if you have any feedback, please shoot us an email, uh, whether it be a thumbs up or uh, constructive criticism about how you think it could go better. Um, we will be doing this next week, next Thursday. Uh, Lisa will be leading a session on iPad note-taking, 
that a lot of our students are doing. So you can see uh, firsthand how students are taking notes on their iPad and you can help support that at home. And then the following Thursday, November, uh, November 9th, got it written on the wall. <laughs> November 9th, we'll be doing a session on uh, Common Sense Media, a great resource and how it relates to di digital citizenship and how we'll be using that at Westlake High School and across the district. Thank you again for joining and uh, hope everybody has a great day.